Hello everyone, welcome to Homemakers Radio. I hope you get a few things done while you listen today. Or if you're just going for a walk, I hope that I can keep you a little bit of company. Don't you remember the olden days when we used to listen to the radio when we did some tedious uh, things and jobs that were rather long? And if you would, if you're new here, please click the link in the description box and go to the page on which I am placing this video because that's where you will receive more information and maybe extra pictures and maybe if I have time I will put a an outline of what I talked about. So today we're having a day at home on Homemakers Radio. So if you'd like to just listen that's fine. If you'd like to go for a walk maybe you could do that or maybe you want to go and clean up some um, grim job as Emma said and uh, so let's begin uh, slowly and I like to think of it as a as easing into the day it's not wise one of the reasons we homeschool uh, and the reason I'm homeschooling you is it's really not wise to uh, jerk people up out of their sleep and, and send them on their way before they can barely think I think it's really important to start out by slowly waking up and not with an alarm. I do use an alarm twice a week, but I'm trying to get myself trained to wake up a lot earlier so I won't have to use it. Sometimes I don't. I have to just turn it off when I wake up and I'll wake up maybe an hour before that. But the reason is a lot of our anxiety comes from these things that we do that are not natural. So begin by slowly listening, uh, not opening your eyes, just opening your ears, and slowly listening to the day, uh, slowly listening, and then uh, gathering in your mind while your eyes are still closed, gathering the intelligence <laughs> around you, the sound of the day, the kind of light, just, just feeling it, looking at it, because babe, this is what babies do. If you watch them waking up, They'll, they'll listen for a while, they'll breathe a little bit, and you know they're listening, and then they're opening up to see where they are, uh, kind of getting associated with the, uh, with the atmosphere and where they are and where their mother is, where the voices are, and um, if they're still in their little bed, and just the familiarity. So just adjust to the sound of the day. We have here the cooing doves. So I know you're jealous because... It just makes me feel so rich. I have the cooing doves and they don't, I, I've tried to keep track of them like I do the trains. I hear the train whistle at, you know, four o'clock in the morning and then again at six and, and then, but the cooing doves are not like the train. They're not on schedule and I can't tell you exactly what time they come and um, make the noise, but I'm always glad that when they do. And so then adjust as you wake up. Now open your eyes and uh, see where you are and what does, just look at your room and the life that you have as brand new, like you just got here, like you just woke up. And uh, take in the scent, the scent, in, the scent that you smell and uh, thank God for the day and for sparing our lives so far. And uh, giving us a purpose and ask him to reveal this to us throughout the day and to be able to live for him and what he wants us to accomplish. But also the value of not jumping out of bed. Now I realize a lot of us have to because we have children, we have people in the house and we have to get ready. But those of you who can, uh, if you get in the habit of going to bed when you're tired and waking up when you're not, there will be a lot more time for you to wake up slowly. And so gather your thoughts. Don't rush ahead of your thoughts. Remember the butler I read, uh, the quote that I read from the butler where he said, I let, like to wake up early and let the day catch up to me rather than wake up late and try to catch up to the day. Now what that means is he's got a little time now to have a cup of tea and to think 
and gather his thoughts. One of the problems we have such an uh, for having such an anxious society is our thoughts rarely catch up with the speed in which we live. When you think of driving in the car and going 20 miles away and coming back uh, within a couple of hours, your mind has hardly had time to catch up to where you've been and what you've done. And we don't realize that because it's so common. But if you can imagine, uh, one of my favorite scenes in the 19, is it 1995 Pride and Prejudice? Um, was it the uh, BBC production? And uh, was the carriage uh, when the, uh, the aunt and Elizabeth were going to see um, Pemberley? And that carriage ride. And I thought, you know, those horses are probably going faster than a human being could walk, but not so fast that their minds could not catch up with what they were doing. For example, uh, they could had time to view the lake as it went by. When we're driving, there's barely time to catch a glimpse of anything. And, and so uh, our modern highways are really a great disadvantage uh, to our mind and, and can... Uh, the use of them can create more anxiety. But I watched this scene. If you get a chance to watch this scene of them in the carriage, the, her aunt and uncle and her going to uh, Pemberley, imagine being on this trip and seeing the whole countryside, being able to see the flowers, being able to see everything that you pass by. We can't do that, can we, today, unless we walk. So today, uh, since we're spending a day at home, we might go for a walk. I will talk about it. I won't be able to carry anything around right now. I'm not quite sure. I need uh, an eight-year-old to come and teach me how to film uh, a walk as I go. Um, I'm just uh, stuck in my ways here. I'm still living in the olden days, uh, sitting in front of the computer. So... So I had thought of um, having a two-hour vacation for someone. Think about this. Would you be able to do that? Give someone who needs a bit of a rest from anxiety a two-hour vacation. And what would you do with that two hours in your home? And what would you do with them? What kind of a schedule would you have? I think that a lot of you are tremendously smarter than I am and would think of a nice little schedule uh, with an afternoon tea and other things, um, maybe a nature walk, uh, maybe a um, story time, maybe a sitting in the swing in the yard rest time. Uh, there, And I, I think you could probably think of a lot more clever things than I can right now. But what would you do if you were required to give, and you know, this is a new business the art of um, the two-hour vacation. So there, I've given you another title, and you can write a book. <laughs> because what do we need? Look, this is a new enterprise on the make. Uh, this is something that is very much needed right now uh, because it's something you can do in your home. And then rather than uh, make it a business, uh, if you didn't want to make it a business, uh, they, could, uh, they could donate. But it could still be a business to give someone are, are there places that you ha that you have gone in the past or you just want to go over and over and you want to go again and again there have been places like that here that just had this sweet nostalgic historical uh, feel and look and, and you enjoyed going in and, and there was one of them that we liked to go to that was an old house and they'd had a tea room in there but you could also tour the rooms and you just wanted to go again and again. And whenever I asked anyone, would you like to go somewhere? Where would you like to go? They always wanted to go to this place. I forget what it was called. The house on something street. <laughs> and uh, so if you could think of this, how would you give somebody a two-hour anti-anxiety break? <laughs> and how would you do this? And so this is something to think about. This is part of... The Thrive Lessons that I teach to my children and grandchildren is give, let me give you an assignment and then you plan this two-hour vacation and I'll come and see you and you take me on it. Now, doesn't that sound exciting? Isn't that a capital idea? 
<laughs> so a two hour vacation. So anyway, this is a one hour vacation for you. And I do hope you get some things done that are that you find that you are necessary and worthwhile. And but on the Thrive classes, the way to have a Thrive class, if you don't have anybody that you can get on Zoom and give them an assignment and they give you an assignment or everybody have what I like to do is give everyone an assignment, including me. And one of the assignments was what can you do with a brown paper bag? And uh, I'm excited to see what they come up with. I've come up with a couple of things myself um, because this is a very nice medium. It's it's actually an art medium. And uh, But I'm going to do the assignment too, so you can't have uh, different assignments. However, when it comes to reading something or um, discussing a concept like Philippians 4, 8, whatever's lovely, uh, everybody gets to say something different. And of course, we're all doing the same assignment, but we're doing it in a different way. So I think that uh, for Thrive, uh, if you want to start a Thrive program for yourself before you get all your grandkids on Zoom, this is the, basically what it is. You give yourself an assignment of something that is delightful to you and you fulfill it. And then you report on it. You, you absolutely have to do it. It's like what it is akin to is these uh, art teachers. You know, you, you get a art journaling uh, class that you're taking online or uh, just a watercolor class, anything like that, and they will give you an assignment. And the teacher will say, go and buy a yellow pear and uh, paint the yellow pear or go and buy a rose. And these are this is what it is, is to give yourself an assignment and, and do it. Now, what I like to do, of course, Maybe you would like to too. So I'll take a book that I have that I got because it was interesting. I had flipped through it and I and I liked it. I liked it because I had uh, really good things and good taste, good pictures, good lessons and good good ideas in it. But I never did anything with it. So now I'm taking them. I didn't bring the book I'm using now, but I I have one that I found recently called Scandinavian Crafts. I love the colors. They use a lot of aqua and pink and uh, clear yellows and whites and uh, I'm going to make one of the items in it as an assignment for myself and it's a tea cozy. Now I have seen all kinds of tea cozies over the years that are just beautiful. Some of them are like uh, uh, crocheted tea cozies that look like baskets or cakes or whatever but this one is made out of the different uh, printed cotton fabrics and it looks like a three-tiered wedding cake and I'd really like to try that and so that I gave myself that assignment now it ha might happen that I can't do it or that I reach a snag in it and decide it's not worth my time it's not working out the way I wanted it's okay I don't have to do it okay so now you've begun slowly on the day and some people just don't like to eat right away. I'm one of them. I'm just not even hungry till 11 o'clock or even noon. I could probably wait till 2. <laughs> uh, so with us, uh, and maybe with you too, you might want to start with a cup of tea. Now I have recently gotten very interested in hibiscus tea. Uh, and you probably have this in your country, but hibiscus tea... Um, I read a little bit about it and it's uh, very good for your immune system. Now your immune system consists of several layers and you know the outer layer is your is your skin so you want to really be careful about getting it scratched, poked or cut, anything like that. And uh, that's why I warn you against the uh against things that uh the medical establishment wants wants to do to us. And so uh, but, and to protect yourself, uh, I'm out in the country, so I really have to watch it because we have rose thorns and we have uh, thistles and all kinds of thorny things. And that's why I wear sleeves. Uh, but I wanted to tell you something really interesting about my own health. Now, everybody's different, so I can't recommend anything. But this uh, hibiscus, I haven't found any plain hibiscus. This is mixed with wild raspberry, and you can get it mixed with other things. But uh, um, I sent Mr. S out today because he's my butler, and when he goes out, he always wants to know if he can stop anywhere and get something for me. He finds it interesting to do my shopping, 
after all these years, I tell him, now you know what I've been through all these years. I don't miss pushing the cart around. I'm staying home more. Um, but uh, it's uh, it does make you feel better, and uh, it's just really good. It's a herbal infusion of tart hibiscus and raspberries. And so I wanted to tell you about that because some people just don't like to eat first thing in the morning, and a lot of people just don't like the traditional breakfast, uh, if especially if it's heavy. And um, so take it easy and just... Um, just go with what you like and what you respond to the best. And so, so if you're also going to be getting ready now, and uh, before you get ready, I'd like to share with you my teacup. And it goes with my, uh, it's, it's a Hawaiian dress, and I'll stand up here and get back here, so hopefully so you can see this dress. Um, made it years ago. Let's see if you can see it. And uh, it's 100% cotton. It's got that what I call the Hawaiian print that was so popular years ago. And it's one of the cotton dresses I like to wear around the house, especially when it's hot and we have still got heat, but we are enduring it as best we can. So anyway, this is my this is my teacup, and um, does that look like a peony or a peony to you? That's what I think it is. So now uh, it's important for you to take care of your appearance. Uh, you've woke, you've uh, awakened quite slowly, and uh, you've taken in uh, all the intelligence around you, and then you have. Uh, decided to go and get uh, bathed and uh, all this involves thinking you should never be doing it uh, so fast and mechanical as if you are in a, um, you are in some kind of a training camp or anything like that because uh, it's very important that your mind uh, be able to catch up with what you're doing and when we do things too fast they uh, you, know, you watch little children uh, when they when they have to go somewhere whatever they don't like to be disturbed they don't like to be um, interrupted when they're really engrossed in their play this is very important for their minds but us too you know we're children too in a way and it's never too late to uh, have a happy childhood so um, so let's start by um, scrubbing up and looking uh, the best we can even if you think quote no one's going to see me well you'll see yourself every time you walk past a window <laughs> or a mirror or someone uh, uh, takes a picture which we hope not I did discuss this problem years ago because there are some people that can't take a picture a good picture of anyone and they'll get them um, looking uh, sideways or or uh, just you know in, in a strange expression and uh, post it somewhere so I've uh, encouraged you please to try to look your very best sometimes you can't stop people from taking pictures of you although I have begun to say if you'd like a picture of me I will send one to you because they seem to um, they seem to not be able to get one clear enough uh, to represent me as well as I would like and um, people would say you know was that you in that picture I didn't recognize you and so we can't always trust our photographers so I think it'd be good to say uh, find a picture that you like of yourself that you think represents you in your best light and a lot of times people snap pictures of us when we're not at our best uh, and maybe we didn't know we were going to get our picture taken uh, but this is one reason in the morning to go and get dressed anyway, just in case. Always be your best, just be, just in case you do get your picture taken, even if you don't want to. So, now, I want to read a little bit to you today, too. And uh, so maybe while you're getting dressed and you're getting ready, I'll read to you a little bit about, uh, from this book here, that I've been reading from 1948 by Lillian Watson called The Standard Book of Etiquette. Now, 
every era has and generation has had etiquette ladies which is really good and every era needs their own because we have different different types of industry and we have a diff different types of society and and different problems so but in general the basis of etiquette is courtesy and that is to do whatever it takes to make other people feel comfortable and not to offend them now of course we've got a crazy society that says uh, they're offended about you being nice or you're they're offended because you thanked them or they're offended because you sent them a note a thank you note uh, that's craziness we we do have our share of those people don't we and or they're offended because you did not do what they uh, were doing we're all different you know and when this whole uh, war started I wasn't participating in it I wasn't going I was gonna wait and see what was going on and I wasn't gonna jump right in and do whatever the government said because they they aren't any uh, they are not very intellectual people to tell you the truth and they're not scientists and they're not physicians and they're not researchers uh, they're just dictators so I decided I would wait and a lot of people were unhappy with me because I just decided well I'm not gonna just jump in and 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 do this because they said do this I would like to wait so we have those types that get offended if you don't obey them <laughs> and um, but you know um, God will give you better friends I think so I want to read a little bit out of this book is called um, it's called informal visiting and I thought it was very interesting because it it addresses the very same things that happen to us today and I wanted to read it for that reason let me just see if there's anything that I've skipped here informal visiting now today we're so blessed because we can text someone and say is it okay uh, if I come over whereas in the olden days you couldn't you had to um, usually they would if it was a someone who lived a far piece away they would write a letter and tell you when to expect them and then you could write back and say yes or no they could come uh, but normally if they lived in the same area um, you just didn't know if they were going to come and you always tried to be ready there was always something you could serve them and make them feel welcome so informal visiting now we don't have to worry about it uh, because we are we can make a mad dash put everything away before they get here right after we get the text so although visiting among good friends is on a much more casual and informal basis today than it has ever been, certain long-established customs and traditions still remain. These unwritten laws of courtesy and considerate visiting must be observed if you want to be welcome and a well-liked guest in other people's houses. You know, have you ever had a visitor that uh, just ran wild in your house and you just never wanted to invite them again? They would open everything and and uh, wander around and uh, and just be just nose into everything that was private you know that is one reason I warn you not to let uh, officials into your house because this is privacy and if you ever, if you watched the Aussie Cossack uh, his house being raided it was very interesting I thought it was so interesting he had a, a friend called him while he was live streaming it and he said I'm sorry I, uh, I'm in the middle of a house raid <laughs> I'll have to call you back <laughs> a police raid I'll have to call you back <laughs> anyway uh, they uh, said that they were going to uh, videotape it uh, the house so that everything could be put back in order afterwards but they didn't put it back in order. They left his room, uh, the bed unmade. They had undone the bed and, and everything. But in a way, we we have to also remember that we don't let our guests do that. We wouldn't let someone come in our house and go through everything. Uh, and sometimes a guest can feel like somebody who's raiding, you know. So, uh, and being a preacher's wife of 50 years, I've endured some of it. But I realize a lot of people just don't know any better, you know. Uh, 
and they and people rarely get invited so they're excited you know they want to go around and uh, learn more about you and uh, I even had a, a young woman come one time and wanted to spend the day with me because she wanted to learn um, about my faith and uh, how to you know she wanted to have more faith but you know you can't do that because your faith has to come from yourself and your interaction with God and so that's the only way to develop so while you might admire some older woman you really can't um, have her, she can't really rub off on you her faith can't rub off on you you have to get that yourself um, and so let's go back to informal visiting shall we uh, for example However relaxed the etiquette of informal visiting may be, one still doesn't barge in on friends at mealtimes. That used to be quite a habit in the old days, back in the 50s. And uh, I think in the, by the 60s, they had put a, people had put a stop to it. But back in the 50s, that was quite common. You would see that on an old Andy Griffith show, um, the Sheriff of Mayberry, remember, where people would drop by just in time to eat. <laughs> And uh, so that was that really was a problem. And uh, finally, I think some people, the society in general rejected it, I think, and just put a stop to it uh, because we don't have it so much anymore. Uh, I think the last time I ever saw it done might have been in the early 60s. And I it had been so long since someone had barged in just in time for meals that I'd I didn't get it, you know, until someone said, I think they would like something to eat. And, um, and it's, it was always polite to serve somebody something to eat. If you were eating, you didn't eat in front of people. You always offered them something. Uh, and they don't barge in on friends at mealtimes, nor when the baby is being bathed, nor when others are being entertained. Well-bred people do not make a habit of invading the privacy of others, even their best friends. They do not arrive at a house sooner than expected, nor remain later than convenient. Well-bred people try to be at their most gracious and agreeable best in company, friendly and pleasant, holding up their end of the conversation and making the hostess' task of entertaining easier. They are careful when they put their lighted cigarettes. Remember I told you everybody smoked in the olden days. We all had ashtrays. <laughs> Can you believe this? Oh, I'm so glad that stopped, you know. Um, when you think of raising little children around uh, these ashtrays, it was very common when I was little um, to have to wash the ashtray because uh, that was just part of everybody's life and you always had a clean ashtray out there for people but I don't think uh, that my family my parents actually liked it but uh, people tolerated it well-bred people try to be at their most gracious and agreeable best in company friendly and pleasant holding up their end of the conversation you know that's such a good point you see, this is 1948 I'm reading, but honestly, have you ever been on the phone or visited somebody who did not talk? And they, they, wanted, they wanted to see you and they asked you to come over or they called you up or something. And they're passive at the other end of the line. Have you ever seen that you can, uh, your voice is about to wear out by the time you're finished with them because they cannot keep up their end of the conversation? That's passivity at its worst and it's very very rude what they need is a course oh here's another job for you <laughs> the art of conversation <laughs> and you can teach a course on your thrive class on how to give and take in a conversation what to answer and how to answer uh, we do have a problem today this is why this book is still applicable we do have a problem today and that is with people wanting to be good conversationalists sometimes don't make it make a terrible mess of it because they grab on to the wrong end of the conversation and go with a tangent that has nothing that doesn't edify anybody that actually becomes um, quite atrocious and so we really need to teach people how to focus on the subject how to focus on what the other person's um, goal is and what they're talking about and um, how not to be rude, how not to 
contradict constantly so that it's uh, upsetting and uh, just how to be gracious it it doesn't hurt to be gracious it doesn't hurt to be kind they are careful when they uh, see they never turn on the radio use the telephone or even open a window without first asking permission yes you know in the olden days it be it was pretty amazing how people were so familiar I mean they would think nothing of turning on the radio or picking up the telephone and using it they never make themselves at home in any house except their own never forget that they are guests and with all a guest's traditional obligations of courtesy and consideration it is difficult if you've got really good friends and their house is so comfortable you just feel like one of them uh, it is difficult to remember that you're the guest but you must always be just a little bit uh, reticent you know a little bit reluctant to yeah. excuse me a little bit reluctant to be too too casual and too familiar uh, and then thank them politely when you leave thank you very much for inviting us even though they're old friends and they don't expect it it's very important that you don't impose yourself too much the whole keynote of courteous informal visiting among friends can be summed up in a single word on selfishness whether you drop in for five minutes to say hello now that's thing that's something if they're going to come for five minutes to say hello then that should be all it is and as, as interesting as you are and they are you should limit it and they should uh, say goodbye before people get tired of them um, now of course that doesn't apply to people that you really like um, it is just uh, people that maybe aren't as good of friends need to be very cautious before trying to impose themselves uh, remember that unselfish considerate behavior is the outstanding quality of a well-liked guest dropping in on friends many young social minded people love to have friends drop in at any hour of the day or evening they are delighted to stop whatever they are doing at any time to visit with a chance caller and there are those many others the shy newcomers in a community and the shut-ins and the lonely people of the world who long for visitors and eagerly welcome them at any time but at the other extreme are the people with busy well-ordered lives people whose time is strictly budgeted to include all their many interests and activities to such people privacy is a precious thing they can be greatly distressed by even a brief unexpected visit that upsets the carefully planned routine of the day but they may be too polite to show it I think it's very important to ask is it okay if I drop by unexpected visits are good form only if you are reasonably sure you are welcome that you are not interrupting or intruding and most important of all that you are not keeping your friends from other things they want to do you know we have a social addiction problem and especially in this day and age when there's been a little more time to uh, for leisure and uh, so and social things social life can be so addicting that when they're gone when there's no one around you can't stand the silence you 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 have mental problems over it because of the social addiction and the best way to overcome it is to spend a few days completely alone without anyone outside of your own family or just uh, not having any social life and get get to know the quiet and the silence and be comfortable with it so that you don't panic when you start having withdrawals from uh, a large social life and I think this is one of the things that have people have to, had to overcome during the war uh, is overcome the fact that uh, their social life is changing but we have the advantage we can still write letters this has been a big puzzling uh, question to me is why did the post office stay open <laughs> so we can write letters and uh, our social life can continue in a different way I don't know what I did with the magazine I had that showed this antique letter that was published in this magazine and it was this beautiful handwriting with drawings all over the page too that was quite entertaining there is so much you can do with other types of socialization
Okay. When not to stay. It's very important to be observant when you drop in on people. Read the unmistakable signs that say whether or not you are welcome. Here, as in every social contact, the quick perception and understanding of other people's feelings is the most useful asset you can have. If your friend's face lights up when she sees you at the door, if she explains how wonderful come in, and you can detect the unmistakable ring of sincerity in her voice. You can assume she is glad to see you and that you have not at an, come at an inconvenient time. But if the smile is a little weary, the hello a little absent-minded, ask quickly, are you busy? A good friend will be frank about it. I always like it uh, for a phone call. Are you busy? Can you talk? And then you can be just honest with them because they're not going to be offended. Uh, most women at home know what it's like to be extremely busy and if I were to call and say are you busy now don't talk to me if you're busy uh, because I don't want to take up your time and she would say yeah I'm, I am busy it wouldn't hurt my feelings a bit I wouldn't feel a bit offended um, so if you've got people that can be honest with you that's nice too a good friend will be frank about it if she's expecting guests, or going somewhere, or busy, or tired, or just out of sorts, she will say so. But if she doesn't, it's up to you to notice such things as a table spread with letters or papers, a book reluctantly closed and put aside, a coat ready and waiting to be put on. You know, uh, probably all of you have had the problem of just getting ready to go out somewhere. You had a big long list and your window of time was very short because you wanted to get home before a certain hour and you wanted to go out before it got real busy in town and um, too congested and someone came over and spent the rest of the day with you. <laughs> and so um, we have to be cour courteous about this. Then you should say at once, we were out for a walk and we just stopped to say hello. We are not staying. We'll come back some other time. That's beautiful, isn't it? We were out for a walk and we will just stop. We just stopped to say hello. We're not staying. We'll come back some other time. Your friend may, there are very few people that can do that. It's just beautiful. Your friend may put on a fine show of cordiality begging you to stay, but the chances are she doesn't mean it. Nobody likes to be interrupted in the middle of writing a letter or getting ready to go out. But if she brightly insists that you stay, even though you can see for yourself you've come at a more, more con most convenient time, don't stand at the door and argue about it. Come in and stay for a little while, but only a little while. Then your friends won't feel they have been rude or ungracious toward you, and you won't feel you've seriously upset or disturbed their plans. You know, I think this is important to read this thing because we're going to enter a time that the, like the, uh, the Hebrews did when they left uh, the land of Goshen and they crossed the Red Sea and then they went into the wilderness. They had to learn a whole different set of social rules uh, because they didn't have another uh, authority controlling their every move anymore. They didn't have enough. They weren't going by another government and they weren't going. So God had to tell them how to act towards their brethren. And in a way, it was a lesson in courtesy. You know, don't uh, hurt your neighbor's uh, property and don't uh, you know, don't offend people and don't do this and do do that and, uh, you know, how to be helpful and all this stuff and, and more. And uh, so we are entering something very similar because when the war is over, you know, after we've won, we are going to have a little more freedom, a lot more freedom, probably more than, um, than we had before. Uh, it's kind of like getting rid of a headache. Uh, if I've ever had a headache, I've noticed that after, a, if I sleep it off and I've had a good rest and the headache is gone, I feel actually better and less anxious and less tense 
than I did before I even got the headache. So what this is going to be like is that we're going to have to learn some, we're going to learn this uh, courtesy again of how to act around people because we're going to be interacting more with people. And there are going to be a lot of people that actually benefited from captivity and enjoyed uh, using the time to explore their creative uh, abilities and uh, they became more proficient in something and really enjoyed having the time to do that. There will be time for that. And uh, they will want to change, maybe change some things in their lives. And there are some people that will enjoy having a company more, but appreciate it more, appreciate people more. Before we were uh, able to have people all the time, see people all the time, anytime we want. And I think we lost our uh, appreciation for their precious, precious individual souls. Well, that's going to change now. I noticed uh, we had a ladies' uh, fellowship here a couple of weeks ago, and there were 12 of us here. And I just noticed how kind and loving they were to each other. There was lacking in the tension, and that they, because most people bring in a certain amount of their own tension from their own uh, families and their own uh, work or their own struggles at, uh, in their businesses or whatever. But I noticed how much they appreciated one another and I could see the softness. I could see it and uh, detected it and uh, they smiled a lot. The singing was absolutely beautiful and uh, then the lady that presented uh, the lesson was uh, so appreciated and uh, so I, I just noticed I think that they're appreciating each other more whereas before it was like school. Uh, you have to go and you have to see these people and uh, it's not like you had a choice. Whereas now, I think uh, when people get together, it's their choice and they enjoy seeing each other. It reminded me, of course I'm out here on, on farmland in the country, it reminded me of a scene from Love Comes Softly. Do you remember when the harvest uh, get together uh, occurred and Marty went to it and got to see some of the other people there before the winter set in and they all uh, there were tables outside and they were all sharing a meal and visiting one another and enjoying one another and her husband explained to her that they did this once a year because they're going to be kind of cooped up for the next few months and this harvest time was the last time they would be able to socialize and see each other before everything froze up <laughs> so in a way that was the scene that it, it evoked. So it's very, um, very inter interesting. So I'll just read one more part of this too, okay? Don't drop in at inconvenient hours. There's still another factor in connection with unexpected calls. Nobody likes to be seen, even by good friends, in house dress and curlers. There, that's, this is from 1948. Therefore, any dropping in should be done at a sensible time of the day when people are likely to be dressed and presentable. That's why I say we probably should be presentable just, just in case, as early as possible, <laughs> and the house ready for visitors. If you have reason to visit someone in the morning or late evening, it's best to telephone beforehand and ask if it's convenient. It only takes a minute to telephone and it may save a lot of embarrassment. How long to stay? Knowing when to leave is important in any kind of visit. Being alert to signs of weariness or restlessness in your hosts. If you notice them glancing at the clock, <laughs> see that's a sign, that's a signal. Don't naively ask, are we keeping you from something? Of course you are, but they're likely to be too polite to admit it. So if you have any reason to believe your host and hostess are tired or have something else to do, to put it plainly, would like to see you go, get up and say goodbye. Never risk outstaying your welcome. Do you remember that old, I believe it might have been an Andy Griffith episode. I can't think if it was that one or not, but you know, one of the beautiful things about old fashioned comedy was it's kept us all in line because nobody wanted to be like the buffoon on this show or that phone. They, they would just use the most ridiculous um, behavior uh, as comedy and no one wanted to do that and there was a they had some friends or some relatives that came and um, they stayed a few days 
And then they said, well, we've stayed a few days and we don't want to out, well, uh, out, we're, we're out our welcome. Uh, so we're going to go uh, today. And so Andy and, and Barney said to them and, and everyone that was there at his house said, oh, no, uh, you know, you're not bothering us. Uh, y you can stay a while longer. And I think, and they were just being polite. And that's the way we used to do it. We'd say, oh, well, it's too bad you can't stay longer. And it was just a polite thing to say. And people knew that it, you didn't really want them to stay. But uh, you would say, well, it's too bad you can't stay longer. Well, uh, we're really going to miss you. And uh, then, then they would go. But these people didn't take the hint. So whenever Andy said, well, uh, too bad you can't stay longer, they would say, oh, okay, well, we'll stay another day. And so this just dragged on and on, and, and Andy was being polite. And he would say, we just, and B, Aunt B was being polite, and they were saying, uh, well, it's too bad you can't stay longer. Well, uh, I'm sorry you're leaving. And that would be just what we would normally say when someone was leaving. We didn't mean we want you to move in. We just, we just said it because it was polite. Well, this family stayed and stayed and stayed and I think they finally tricked them into leaving and I can't remember if you can remember what that episode did to get them to leave uh, but they they changed their they changed the way they responded to it after a while <laughs> um, and I believe the name of the family was the darlings when the darlings came but a lot of these old shows uh, just took human nature and the uh, the rude people and turned them into shows and comedies, and no one wanted to be like that. Well, we don't have this kind of comedy anymore. So, dropping in on friends in the country. So we'll end with that. For some reason, people who wouldn't dream of intruding on their relatives or friends in the city seem to think it's perfectly all right to descend bag and baggage on friends in the country. But it's neither courteous nor fair to impose on people just because they happen to have country houses. We noticed this with uh, living so close to the, uh, to the ocean that uh, there was a family I knew that said their relatives came um, from all over because they wanted to go to the ocean and so they would use their house as a stopping place and also want to be driven to the ocean uh, because it's you know it's quite a route through the mountains and everything and uh, so finally he said after so many years of it he'd just give them the keys uh, to the car or draw them a map and send them on their way <laughs> to the ocean and tell them where the accommodation was and you know what was the, what were the best hotels um, no one should ever arrive at a beach or country house expecting to spend the day or be put up for the night without having been specifically invited. Although it was once the custom for people living in the country to keep open house for their friends, the rules of hospitality have now changed to conform with our busier lives and broader interests. Today, it's a fixed rule that guests come only when invited and remain only as long as they are asked to stay. Of course, dropping in for a brief visit is friendly and pleasant when you happen to be in the vicinity of someone you know and like, but staying for an entire day or expecting to stay overnight is an imposition that well-bred people do not practice. So that was 1948. We might have to have somebody write us a new, um, a new etiquette book, or there might be something that already is there online that you might be interested in. Now, I have talked to you about the word abounding, and this was part of the idea of having a Thrive class, or a Thrive, we call it Thrive University, and uh, that is to do something that will help you abound. And I am not talking about um, cleaning out the bookshelf or something that would make you feel better, but this is thing. these are things that would uh, give you more life almost instantly. And so I wanted to read a verse uh, in the Bible from Colossians chapter 2 verse 7 rooted and built up in him and established in the faith just as you were taught abounding in thanksgiving now had you ever thought about using uh, thankfulness and thanksgiving as one of your thrive lessons as uh, just the every every little thing uh, and that 
one of the reasons that we have so much anxiety is that being thankful has anxiety pushes thankfulness out so while you're all tense and you're all upset and you have a lot of anxiety you're not thinking about the things that you need to be thankful for or you're not really filled with thanksgiving and one of the great things about waking up slowly is the thankfulness that comes to your mind and you have time for it we mustn't be so rushed around as a homemaker that we uh, push out thankfulness that we feel that we don't have time to feel grateful or thankful and uh, You can't abound without it uh, So that is you know, maybe you don't want a thrive class Maybe you ought to have a, an abound class instead of a thrive class people are using that word thrive for everything there's a there's a thrive a hair product and there's a, a thrive radio program and there's a thrive uh, exercise programs and everything so maybe you want to put a biblical word like abound you can have an abound class so um, if that doesn't sound uh, too foreign to some people so we want to talk a little bit each time that I come here about anxiety because I am the queen of anxiety and I I'm very familiar with it you remember mr. Bennett um, telling Mrs. Mrs. Bennett says you don't have any uh, concern for my nerves and he said well I do they've been my good friends all these years <laughs> and uh, so being the queen of anxiety I do think I know a little bit about it and one of the things that has helped is this idea of abounding in thanksgiving and making that a habit whenever an anxious thought comes turn it around to, to something thankful and train your mind you might have to do it 40 times a day and also the other thing was I told you to turn to prayer for everything every little thing that creates anxiety every anxious thought but I ran across somebody's exercise I'm always always looking for you know if some exercise is good then more would be better so I'm always looking uh, for somebody's exercise that has to do with anxiety and found several of them um, exercise for anxiety or and they're not real exercises they're, they're stretches and their movements but one of them was the simple simple movement of leaning over and trying to touch your toes on how that is one of the first things that you can do to resu uh, reduce anxiety and when you think of it it's just a, a kind of a, a limber sort of hanging there even if you don't touch your toes but it works and it's very very helpful and I had told you a couple of things later. The other thing I would say is get all chemicals out of your body uh, that are foreign to your body. Uh, have a look at all your chemicals that you take and see what their side effects are. Because, look, we have anxiety and we can't, you know, everything is figure outable. You can trace everything to a reason. Uh, and I've told you before, when you find out where things are coming from and what's causing uh, something that's puzzling you or, or frightening you or creating anxiety when you find out what it is you're not afraid anymore and you're not you don't have the anxiety and anxiety I think and fear are connected um, so do your best to look in the Bible for the word anxious and anxiety and then look up the word and the, its meaning in the 1828 dictionary or the, the old dictionaries and look up the um, root words for it and do a study on it hey you could put that in your abound class and uh, so uh, I do want to uh, ha go get my notes now because I've done all the reading so I want to do a little bit about uh, my notes here uh, and one thing that is very important is when you're homemaking and when you're doing all those things going through your your books and the and the kitchen shelves and and organizing things and getting your papers all uh, organized which I believe everybody should try to have uh, a uh, a mini journal art journal any uh, scrapbook type journal and stuff so that you can leave something for the next generation and help prepare them give them something leave them something leave them a great gift um, if everything is on your phone it's not the same so do get yourself into things that you can do with your hands like the art journal like the uh, the mini journals that have all the little 
things in them and the memories and the uh and the, your little places to put your little sayings and your pictures and get back into pictures and things like that so that you can build up some kind of a life memory for future generations they will uh appreciate you for it they will love you for it remember the lady who's book was found by her granddaughter I believe and it was the country diary of an Edwardian woman it, she had just kept a diary for one year and she put sketches in it of uh, nature uh, places that she went for a walk or observed in the country can you do that could you do that just why don't you just try for one month to make yourself a mini journal just put 30 pages in it and try to do something with that for one month or one week um, uh, one thing that I've been trying to do, 14 days is about my limit. I, I can't think a year ahead, but 14 days, maybe I can, is to do one of those 14 day challenges of, uh, exercises for, uh, for older women. And also 14 days without eating, um, sugar and, uh, refined things. And, uh, so I'm, I, I would like to try that and, so there's so much you can do. This is part of your uh, your abounding or thriving. You can give yourself assignments like this. And you can do it from day to day. Just just give yourself an assignment for today. And uh, for I've already mentioned some of them um, were just uh, give yourself the, uh, the assignment of looking your best today. Maybe that would be a good assignment. Just start out slowly. And uh, remember to pray every day. And at the end of the day, maybe read something aloud. Think about that, how important that is to practice your elocution and to read something aloud with expression and learn about, uh, learn about uh, reading. And also, another thing that you can do, I mentioned writing letters. Had you thought of making a little package for someone? Put some little things in it that you can mail and uh, and send something to someone. Another thing that I have done that uh, that uh, is that is very very helpful is to order something to myself for myself that I need. You know, my food. Uh, I've ordered food online and tea and. Um, maybe art supplies or even fabric so that I know something is coming. Something is coming to the door. It makes me feel very human. Some of you who live alone might need to do that. Order some things for yourselves. Not all at once, but so that it comes sporadically, like once a day or twice a week or something like that. Don't order it all the same day. And that way you know that every day there will be something coming for you. Um, and... Uh, now, I had thought, too, uh, at the end of the day, to go for a walk. I've mentioned 20 minutes, uh, but some of you might not be able to do that, maybe five minutes. But how about a silent walk? Just a silent walk without your phone on, without your phone with you. Um, just a silent walk. Don't go too far, but just a silent walk so that you hear the silence. You hear things like the wind and the leaves. And... One of the problems with a social addiction is that silence can bother you. You feel like uh, you're going crazy because you're not hearing voices. You're not hearing other people. And you feel all alone. But you know, nobody is ever all alone forever. And the silent times will end. And during the time when you're being left alone and you're not uh, being able to socialize, put that to good use. Learn something new and um, make a letter make a package, read aloud, learn to sing. I uh, had a list one time of everything you could do at home. I am a veteran homeschooler. We learned you could do everything from hairdressing to uh, hair cutting to uh, everything that you would go, go and do out there, you can do here. Just about everything. We learned uh, the backyard pharmacy, you know, that book called The Backyard Pharmacy, of what all you could do with the herbs that you have in your own in your own area and uh, things that you didn't know you had that are valuable. I remember there was something that I took I had a terrible stomach one one day many years ago 
and I've forgotten what it was, but it was similar to, uh, I'm trying to think what it was, real strong mint, but it was stronger than mint, and it wasn't, uh, it wasn't catnip, and it wasn't lemon balm or anything like that. It was a real strong mint. If I can think of it, I will put it in the uh, text. Uh, and I didn't know anything about it, but I was that desperate. And, of course, I live out in the country, and uh, there wasn't anybody home at that time for some reason. And so I went out and found this thing growing wild and smelled it. It smelled very minty and took it, and it took away the stomach ache. But So we had this book, Backyard Pharmacy, and uh, taught us a lot. But there's so many things that you can do at home. And uh, so that's how you thrive. That's how you abound. Now, I mentioned a detox recipe, and I will try to put the link for that there. Uh, and it was labeled the vaccine detox for people who um, were suffering from the effects of it. And uh, so I'll put that in there. And also I had a recipe for something else. forgot what that was. And um, so I want to tell you one more thing before I go. And that is... There's two bad habits in conversation that we all need to correct, which is kind of going around uh, and every uh, society and every era, every time has has their own habits that, that tend to spread around. And number one is not answering the questions of your children. You don't have to, uh, a lot of children will pester and pester and pester and they want to know something. But you know what? It'd be easier if you would tell your children something in the first place. Don't wait till they get anxious and start asking. Such as uh, maybe you're going to go somewhere. You're going to go shopping. You're going to go out. You're going to go somewhere. Uh, tell them along the way. Okay, we are now uh, 10 more minutes away from, from going. Okay, I'm not quite ready. We should be, you know, and just keep them updated so that they don't pester and cause you to be frustrated. Another thing that uh, I've seen mothers do is uh, not answer the questions. When the children ask them stuff, they're preoccupied and they won't answer. And then the children start to screech and say, please tell me or something. Then the mother gets mad because the child was rude. So a lot of these things you bring on yourself and you can prevent. You, you make, you've got to make it easy for your children to do well. To, do, to be nice and so you have to be nice you have to answer when they when they talk but you can prevent a lot of the questions if you will keep informing them of things if you will keep them um, updated as to what's going to be happening to them what you know what's going on in your lives because they they do need to know a lot of it so and that that also settles them so the other thing that I think we need to all work on because this is another problem that's going around is that in conversation uh, let's say one person says something and then you make a comment oh yeah well that's nice and they'll say well anyway and almost is the word well anyway the words well anyway are almost dismissive do you feel that uh, so you'll be talking to me and I will say well anyway like uh, I'm going to climb over what you just said and, and go on to what I was talking about in the first place. And that word, well, anyway, I don't know why, but it does put a lot of people off uh, because it is dismissive. So let's not say that anymore. You just say, mm-hmm. You just kind of roll with the conversation. But you don't need to say, well, anyway, and then move on. Uh, unless, unless the person is being particularly difficult. I mean so severely difficult that they uh, are still rambling on about something and you don't want to hear it anymore and they, they've gone far enough that would be different but in ordinary conversation with ordinary people you don't need to treat them like that so that's something that I wanted to bring up um, and I hope that uh, to next time I want to read more from beautiful girlhood on the um, making friends with books okay now Books are okay, and the Bible says uh, that there are, there are many books. Solomon said there are many books, you know, uh, you could fill, fill the universe with them. Um, so don't have a faith in books. But, you know, you could actually write your own stories and write your own books. Um, so, so manners will take you no matter what kind of uh, income you have no matter what kind of social standing you have. Manners, I read this somewhere, manners will take you, um, uh, 
Manners mean you can be low income, but not low class. Isn't that nice? So, and I had spoken to you about this when I was reading the book called Up From Slavery by Booker T. Washington. He implored his students who had just come out of slavery to, uh, he started uh, Tuskegee Institute, and he said, when you have manners, no one knows uh, how poor you are because your elocution, your stature, your um, approach with people is going to make you high class no matter how low income you are. And, and this is really important because in the olden days, we did not want people to think we were poor. We, poor was not admired in those days. And so what we did was we tried to be clean and well-dressed and uh, well-mannered and also have uh, impeccable homes. Uh, unfortunately, we've gotten so much more busy today, it's getting harder. So ladies, I hope that you have gotten a lot done and enjoyed spending this day at home with me. And thank you very much for taking the time to leave a comment. And thank you for those who encourage me and those who pray for me. And thank you for taking care of me. And I will show you something that I bought next time. Uh, so thank you very much. And I'll talk to you later. Bye.